All right, you guys ready for the word? Now, before we go any further, please help me welcome all those watching online. Put your hands together for them. Praise God. Thank you so much taking your time and being a part. So now, let me pray. Here we go. Father, I thank you for each and every person. I pray that you bless them, touch them, minister to them. Let your word come alive in each and every one of their hearts. We thank you for what you're doing in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, everybody says... Amen. All right. So here's what we got going on. We have a series that we're doing right now, and it's called The Spirit of Christmas. How many of you know? It's Christmas. It's Christmas. Nobody's excited about it, apparently. But hey, it's Christmas. And uh, coming next weekend, you know, it's going to be Christmas. And then guess what? It's all over. It's all over. But honestly, as a preacher, this time of the year is always tough. And let me tell you why. You know, I've been preaching now for a while. And because of that, every year I'm trying to look at new ideas and different ways to break down the Christmas story and all that. And uh, so this year we kind of went with the idea of the spirit of Christmas. And two weeks ago we kind of brought the first idea to you. Anybody remember what the first message was? What makes Christmas so awesome? Childlike faith. Everybody say childlike childlike faith. And it's that faith that just has simple belief. It believes easy. You don't have to tell kids, you know, and explain everything to them. Matter of fact, they just go with what you tell them and they believe it. And I'm here to tell you there's something about that with the spirit man on the inside of us that we should just read God's word, believe God's word, and trust him at his word. Amen? So we talked about that. Last week we came back and I said, what makes Christmas so awesome? Not only is it a childlike faith, I believe it's peace. Everybody say peace. Peace. And um, peace that surpasses understanding. And I talked to you about three different levels of that. A vertical peace, that you got to have peace vertical, you and God first. Then with yourself, that's the second. And the third would be peace with other people. And that's how you have peace in your life. You have to have all three of those. But it all starts with the vertical peace with God first. All right? Well, last week I gave you that. This week I want to kind of push in on it a little bit further and go with the idea of what Christmas really is all about as far as this idea. And here it is. You ready? Gifts. What is the most used word during the holiday season? Gift. Gift. It really is. Whether you're a Christian or not, the word gift is. And I'm here to tell you that the greatest gift that God ever gave was his son, Jesus. Fair? That's what we're here to celebrate. But I'm here to really push on the idea that God is a gift giver. And God is is a gracious God. He is a generous God. He wants to bless. He wants to give. He wants to be a blessing into our lives. Now, I say that because, not because that sounds, you know, happy, good preaching. It just, it's who God is at his nature. And can I tell you, we are most, you're going to hear this now and you're going to hear it at the end of my message. We are most like God when we're generous and when we bless. That, that's when we are most like God. I'll give you an example of that. If you hadn't heard, here's what we're doing at the church. Someone moved from Kentucky. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about Kentucky and the tornadoes that were going on. And, and here's kind of what, what evolved with that process. So I was praying about, Lord, you know, you see all these people down there and you see what's going on. Last week, I was actually slotted to preach on, on uh, the idea that God is, is generous. That's what I was going to preach on last week. But it didn't feel right in my spirit. So I switched it, and I preached on peace last week. Well, I didn't know, but God knows exactly why. Because here's what happened. The tornadoes hit. Last week, I preached on peace. Then Monday at staff meeting, I said, hey, do we have anybody in our church, or does anybody know anybody that was affected by the tornadoes down there? Because we would love to do anything we can to be a blessing. Well, um, as it would so happen, one of the staff members, Ms. Sharon, she said, hey, uh, we have someone in our church that actually just moved from there. I'm like, really? Yeah, five months ago, they moved from there to here, and they're actually struggling with, the, struggling with the idea that, you know, they've got all their stuff, but their family and their church home down there has been pretty much destroyed. And I said, well, give me her name. Anyway, long story short, 
her and I, we made contact. Then her pastor called me, and I was like, hey, how can we be a blessing to you guys? And this is how it all turned. And they're like, hey, we need totes. We need totes to put stuff in. And just to be honest, that's how it all started. And now we're to the point that this Tuesday, we're loading trucks full of stuff, and we're taking them down there to that place, and we are just going to bless those people. Amen? Amen. How many of you know... I say all that to say this, doesn't it feel good to just bless? Doesn't it feel good to just be gracious and just be a blessing? Can I tell you, you were made that way. You were made that way. And that's another reason I love Christmas, that we get to give gifts. We get to bless each other. We get to give gifts. Now, I'm just going to tell you also that with the idea of gift and gifts comes a lot of stress in my life. You say, how is that? Well, here's our shopping list. On the left-hand side is Michelle's shopping list. She buys for the kids, for her mom and dad, and for her sisters, brothers, teachers, all the way down to me, all right? And then on the right hand is my shopping list, and this is why I'm stressed, because Michelle buys for everybody, and I buy just for her. And now I know you're wondering, you seem like you shouldn't be stressed. She, here's why. She's done. Can I tell you the truth? I haven't even started. Yeah, I, I haven't even, can I get any men in here who have not started yet? You my men, yeah. We're all in it together. We're all in it together. But the reality is, here's the truth, the way it works, you ready? This time of the year, it's all about blessing and giving gifts. And now trust me when I tell you, I got some ideas. I'm gonna go explore those, hopefully today and Monday. But the reality is, pray for me. All right, but even though we're talking about gifts, can I tell you, God gave us the greatest gift, and that's his son. The greatest gift that the the earth has ever received was the gift of Jesus onto this planet. Now, I know this time of the year we talk about Jesus becoming our greatest gift and all that stuff. Can I also tell you, though, everything that God has ever done for you was a gift to you. God is a good God. He is a gracious God. He is a gift-giving God. The fact that you have breath in your lungs is a gift from God. It really is. The fact that you're here is a gift from God. Matter of fact, I came up with, there are probably, I literally could wear you out with scriptures that talk about things that God has given you. Okay, I could wear you out. So I'm only going to give you just a few slides of these, but I want you to see how good God is. The Bible says he's the giver of life. Do you know that you wouldn't even have life if it wasn't for God? You are a gift from God. Your life is a gift. It really is. How about this one? God gives wisdom. Now, I know a lot of times if you look around on the planet, you wonder, hey, partly cloudy on that one. But but the reality is God gives wisdom. Now, it doesn't mean everybody listens to it. I mean, you got people eating Tide Pods. But God gives wisdom, okay? That's why people, you know, they want to argue about evolution. And I'm like, what? What? You want to argue about evolution to show that we evolved. That means, that, that, that must mean we're getting smarter. Have you looked around? Y'all ain't got it like I got it, all right? I'm telling you, there's no way that's right. No way. Anyway, nevertheless, he gives us rain. He gives us rest from our enemies. These are all just simple verses that the Bible, and again, I don't want to wear you out. I just want you to see God is a good God, and he gives gifts. He gives strength. He gives us breath. He gives us grace. He gives glory. How about this one? He gives us a heart to know him. You know, you don't even have that within yourself. He gives you a heart to know him, and I believe he gives that to everybody, but nevertheless. He gives light. He gives freedom and food. I really thought that would be a a little bit more of a good point in the message where people would be like, I like food. All right, how about this? He gives rest from sorrow. He gives you peace. He gives you a future and a hope. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. You guys know that one. How about this? He gives you a crown of righteousness. Here's a couple other things. He gives you what what is good. He gives uh, the desires of your heart. He gives you victory. Come on, God always wins. How about this? He gives you increase. He gives you freely, gives you all things. He gives you all things to enjoy, the Bible says. He gives you the Holy Spirit to those who ask. I'm telling, 
telling you, our God is a gift-giving God. We are more like God when we're giving than any other time. Think about John 3, 16. For God so that he, God is a giver. God is a giver. God is a giver. He's always wanting to bless. He's always wanting to give. He's always wanting to move in our favor. He absolutely wants you and I to understand that he is a gift-giving God. And obviously it culminated whenever Jesus was given to the earth. Here's what it says. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name what? Emmanuel. Being translated or interpreted as God is with God. Absolutely awesome that God would come to the earth and be born in a manger, born to be slain by the end of his life. God gave it on purpose, and God gave him on purpose. Now, why did he do that? Well, he did it because of his love for us. He did it because he is a good God. He is a gracious God. Now, my whole first half of my message is about God is good. God is good. And you need to see God is good. Look at this. This is Acts chapter 15 in the Message Bible, and I love it. It says, don't we believe that we are saved because of the master, I love this, master Jesus amazingly and out of sheer generosity move to save us. Out of his sheer generosity move to save us. How do you see God? Do you see God as generous? I'm here to tell you, God's a generous God. Not everybody has that view of God, but God is generous. And hopefully by the end of my message, I will get you to agree with me that our God is a generous and good God. Because why is that so important? Well, I'll tell you why. And I'm going to say it now, and then I'm going to reiterate it here in a minute. The way you see God is the way you will see yourself and the way you will treat other people. It is so important that you see God the way God really is. Not a distorted view of God. Let me give it to you this way. I believe that one of the oldest tricks in the book is what the enemy does and what he did to Eve. It's what he does. It's what he continues to do. And Christians and believers and non-believers continue to fall for it. And I believe there are two great lies of the enemy. We're going to see one in Genesis 3. But here's the first one. There is a lie that Satan doesn't exist. There are a lot of people that just don't believe in a devil. And that's fine, because if I was the devil, and I really wanted to beat him, and I wanted to beat humanity down, I would do everything within my power to convince people that I don't exist. Because if I can convince people that I don't exist, then I can move all the pieces behind the scenes and no one will ever even know. And that's exactly what he's doing to a lot of humanity. The second thing I would have is this right here. This is the second thing I would do. It says, then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, here's my heart. You ready? Let's go into the story just real quick and understand this. When God created man and woman, and he put them them in the Garden of Eden, they did not have, they were ignorant, and I mean that in the positive sense, in the right word, all right? They were completely ignorant of anything evil or wicked or, or negative, all right? All they knew was life. All they knew was was the goodness of God. They had no understanding of evil, wickedness, wrong. They had no understanding of it. The Bible says whenever God created them, he created them good. And all they understood was good. So in the mind of Adam and Eve before the fall, they did not understand death. They did not understand or comprehend sickness. They didn't understand poverty. They didn't understand or comprehend infirmities. They didn't understand anything that has to do with the fall of man. Nothing. All they knew was good. Can you imagine living in that? That's what heaven's going to be like, y'all. All we're going to know is good. We won't know any evil. We won't want to know evil. We won't participate in evil. This is how Adam and Eve was before the fall. Then what happened? Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan shows up in the garden. What's he do? Take and eat of the fruit. Now, I'm going to give you the Charlie Riley amplified version of this, all right? So here it is. When he showed up, he had a purpose. Satan did. Satan said, I need to distort their view of God. Because as long as they see God as good, as long as they see God as giving them everything, as long as they see God as perfect, they will never, ever want to eat of the tree. 
So what I've got to do is I've got to convince them that God is doing something or holding something back in their world. And that's exactly what he begins to work. He begins to work the idea, well, God doesn't want you to eat of the tree because if you eat the tree, you're going to be like God. See, God wants you to eat the tree because God's holding back on you. God wants you to eat of the tree because you think you got it good now. But God's holding back. If you eat of the tree, you'll be even better. He always promises better. Always promises better. You know? And here's the, what happened. So Adam and Eve, we know that Eve ate first, Adam ate later. Nevertheless, bottom line is, what? whenever they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, evil was opened up to their eyes. And they, for the first time, understood death, decay, sickness, disease, poverty, infirmity, and they released those things into the earth. It was never nor has it, nor ever will be, God's plan to release those into the earth. Man opened up Pandora's box to those things, not God. It was never God to bring death into the earth. It was man who opened the door to those things. Can I get an amen on that? All right? So now, let's fast forward. So now you have death, decay, sickness, disease, all these things released into the earth. And Adam and Eve were the ones who actually released it. Then what you got is, get this everybody, the enemy plays the trick on them and tells them that, no, no, this was God's will. God wanted this to happen. This was never God's will. God made it abundantly clear, stay away from the tree. They chose. Amen? And when they chose, they chose wrong. And they chose, they chose the wrong way. Now, I say all that to say this. There are still people, Christians, believers, church people, that believe that God doesn't want their best, doesn't want their best at hand. He doesn't want to do good things in their life. There are Christians who believe. And how do you get there? I, I, it's just a, it, it's a challenge for me. How you get the idea that God would put sickness on somebody to teach them something, not even a bad earthly father would do that. Why would you believe a heavenly father would do that? A, a heavenly father, which the Bible says and declares is love. Your father in heaven does not want you sick. He doesn't want death. He doesn't want decay. He wants you blessed. He wants you living above and not beneath. Blessed coming in, blessed going out. Above only. That's what he wants for you. But there are Christians who believe the lie of the enemy, who believe that, well, you know, God, he's not always in my best interest. He doesn't always want what's best for me. He does. Just like he told Adam and Eve. Do you know, here's the lie of the enemy. The enemy convinced them that they, on their own, could get better than what God had given them. And you know what? There are people that still believe that. That they can get better on their own than what God could give them. I'm here to tell you, you can't outgive God. Because God is a generous God. He has more for you than you would ever have for yourself. There's no way you can ever outgive what God has planned for you. God is a good, good God. And whenever you begin to break this down, it begins to make sense that God only wants good for his kids. All right? Again, I told you the first half of my message is all about how God is good and God wants to bless you. And I'll tell you why here in a minute. But here's the deal. You ready? Proverbs 3.27. Listen to this. This is Proverbs. Inspired, it, Solomon wrote it, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. And here's what it says. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due. All right? And let me assure you of this. If the Holy Spirit wrote this, God holds himself to the same standard. When it is in your power and your hand to do so, do not say to your neighbor, go and come back, and tomorrow I will give it. When you have it with you, give it now. Do it now. Listen to this, everybody. When God wants to do something in your life, he wants to do it. And there are people who say, Pastor Charlie, I was believing for healing and it didn't happen. I was believing that God would bless my life and it didn't happen. Okay, and their first response to that is, God must have not wanted it for my life. What makes you think so? Could it be that there is an opposition force working in your life called Satan, Lucifer, who is working against everything you're praying and believing for? The answer to that is obviously yes. Yes, everything you're praying for and everything you're believing for and everything you're believing to go right and to go the right direction, I promise you Satan is working on the backside to try and make it come out wrong and not work out. The problem is 
people distort the image of God in their heart. They don't see God as good. So then they start ascribing the thing that's happening in their life to God. Well, it must have been God. No, it wasn't God. Here, every time there's a natural disaster, Kentucky, for example. Well, look, God must have did that. God didn't do that. Listen, John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That is simple, y'all. Let me ask you a question. Does that look like anything, like stealing, killing, and destroying? Yes. Then guess what that is? That's the work of the devil. I just don't think we should be that brash to make judgment that fast. I'm going to tell you straight up, quick, fast, in a hurry. If it's still in killing and destroying, it's the devil. Cancer still kills and destroys. Sickness still kills and destroys. Poverty still kills and destroys. Anything that is still in killing and destroying is of the enemy. It's that clear. It's that plain. It's that simple. Listen. Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and have it abundant. Everything that is connected to you living an abundant life is connected to Jesus. And the Bible says it this way. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above. If it's not good and it's not perfect, it's not from my daddy. Hello? Sickness is not good and it's not perfect, right? If it's not good and not perfect, it's not from God. Don't be dropping off that junk at my doorstep, praise God, because I'm going to kick it, rebuke it, and shoot it with a gun fast. (laughs) Maybe not shoot it. I live in a neighborhood now. But I, anyway, but here's the truth. I'm not receiving it. I'm not receiving it. Why? It's not good and it's not perfect. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above. Listen to this. God only has good things for us. For the Lord God is a son and a what? Watch this. I love this. The Lord will give grace and glory. Say it with me. No, okay, that's your part. (laughs) Say it with me. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk upright. No good thing will he withhold. Our God's not holding back. No good thing will will he withhold. No good thing. God wants us to have the good things. God wants our bodies to be healthy. That's a good thing. God wants our family to be blessed and have good relationship. That's a good thing. No good thing will he withhold. Well, I thought God was with I I thought God was holding back. No, no. The devil's hindering. You need to rebuke the enemy and believe God. Can I tell you what's rolling in my heart real big right now? And I'll probably at the beginning of the year hit on hit on hit on some of this. And that is the idea that spiritual warfare. Right now. That's, that's rolling in me right now, so that's why I'm kind of bleeding over into that area, leaking into that. But the reality is, God wants you and I to understand that he is, a, it's simple, God is a good God, and he's not holding anything back. He's not holding anything back. I don't hold things back for my kids. I want to bless them. I want to be an increase to them. I want to, I want to propel them into what God has for them. I want to be a blessing to them, Right? And God is the same exact way in our lives. So let me ask you this, and maybe you never thought about this, but let me just tell you this. One of the greatest spiritual truths I've ever discovered is that God is like a mirror. Now, let me explain what I'm saying, and then I'll give you illustrations, and then it'll all tie together. All right? God is like a mirror. Here's what I mean by that. How we see God is actually what we become like. And how how we see God is what we become like, and then... That's how we respond to others, okay? How we see God is how we become. And how we become is how we put it on others. So let me give it to you this way. Simple illustration. This happened in our church years ago, all right? So I had a situation where a parent was coming to the church volunteering, all right? Um, She would bring her child. After about two or three days, some of you were here when all this happened. Some of you were. Um, So... um, Coming to the church, she was volunteering, no big deal, she would bring her kid, didn't think nothing about it. After about two or three days, though, I noticed something, that she would come and then the kid was in her classroom the whole time she was here for six, eight hours a day, and the kid never came out of the room, and I thought that was odd. First, second day, I thought, no big deal, by third day, Charlie's twitching, because I'm like, what's going on, this something just don't feel right. So I walked over to the, I didn't go to the parent, I walked to the kid, and I said, hey, uh, I walked into the classroom, and I said, hey, what are you doing in here? They go, oh, I'm, I'm in here. And I go, why are you in here? Oh, I got in trouble. You got in trouble. 
So what did you get in trouble for? Well, talking back. And I go, okay, that's fair. I get that. You shouldn't be talking back. I go, so what's your punishment? And she said, well, for 30 days, I have to isolate myself from the family. I can't talk to the family, and I can only eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And, and can I tell you, <laughs> Charlie's about to flip a lid, all right? And can I just tell you, my first thought was, my first thought, and just know this, I'm a pastor, so my first concern is always church-related. Um, that's just how I'm wired. So my first thought was, you're not going to use the church as a discipline tool to bring your kid here, lock them up in a classroom, and then your kid grow up hating church because you don't know how to parent your kid. So that was my first thought. My second thought was, I'll spare you. So I go over to the parent, and I'm like, hey, talk to me. I just went in there and talked to your daughter, and I'm, I'm just trying to figure this out. Talk to me. Here's what she said. Started talking to her. The kid mouthed off. 30 days, no talking to the family, and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I said, I'm just going to tell you, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. What are you doing? That is not the way it should be parented. That, that's not the way you treat your kids. She said this. She goes, God is my witness. She said, that's the way God is, so that's the way we are. I go, whoa, time out. Time out, back the train up. That's the way God is. And I could tell right away we were going down a path that I didn't want to go without her husband there. So I stopped the conversation. I said, I need an appointment with you and your husband. Anyway, brought him in, set him down. Like, tell me about this idea that you have. So we get into this, and here's what, here's what they said to me. They said, if a child is disobedient and doesn't obey, they have to be punished. And they punish that we're going to punish that child until we feel like the punishment is done, okay? And during that time of punishment, they will have no interaction with the family, and that's that. And, and then they said, because that's the way God does us. I go, time out. That's not the way God is. God is not like that. Okay, this was when the lights came on for me, y'all, and I've noticed it throughout the years over and over again. Maybe not as extreme, but here it was. I said, that's not the way God is. I said, first of all, first of all, if we've sinned, which we sin, if we've sinned, our stupidity was already figured into the equation with Jesus on the cross. That's number one. Two, if we do sin under the new covenant, Jesus already paid for it. Three, we don't break fellowship with God every time we sin. If we do, we'd be getting saved over and over again. And if that's the case, some of us would only say the sinner's prayer because we'd never get beyond that. Fourth, it defies the nature and character of God. The reason he sent his son onto the cross was so that he could have a relationship with us outside of the issue of sin so that when we miss it, he doesn't run from us, he runs to us, he embraces us, brings us close, and restores us. Yes. That's how you parent a kid. Don't beat the kid down and make him feel worse then and isolate him from the family. And then you're going to wonder why at 16 and 17 years old, they're running off with every whatever to find an identity because you destroyed their identity with the family. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about. Anyway, nevertheless, I said, listen, that's not the way it's going to roll here. And, and, and here's the truth. You can be mad, upset, whatever, but you're not going to be allowed to do that here. That's just the way it is. I'm not going to tell you how to parent at your house, but when you come here, yeah, we're not going to let you just put your kid in a room and let them isolate and feed them peanut butter. I'm, I'm going to buy every Chick-fil-A sandwich I can buy, and I'm going to load up that room. I'm going to give that kid everything they want when they're under this place, praise God. They didn't like it, whatever. They don't even listen to me. It's all good. But, but the reality was, here's the truth. When you boiled it all down, listen to my heart, everybody. Listen to my heart. When you boil it all down, the way they saw God was the way they treated each other. Listen to me. Listen. I, Linda, Linda, listen, listen. <laughs> I challenge you right now. I challenge you right now. Think about your own walk and think about other people's walk. How they see God is how they treat other people. Give me an example of my family, all right? My family, we all grew up Catholic. Now, I want you to know this. My, my family is Catholic, and I believe they love God. They've been born again. They serve Jesus, okay? 
they're Catholic. I believe you can be Catholic and go to heaven. I believe you can be Catholic and be born again. I believe in all that, okay? So I'm not anti-Catholic per se. But here's what I will tell you. What I heard as a kid was whenever you're Catholic, you don't really know if God's really forgiven you or not. So if you sin, you have to do works to make it right. Have you ever met anybody that for them to forgive you, not only do you ask for forgiveness, but then you have to do something to show them that they're forgiven? Come on. I'm telling you, how we see God is how we treat other people. It's a direct link to how we treat other people. Now let's flip it around. And I could go with my childhood, all, all kinds of examples, but let's flip it around. Give you a different example, a positive one. All right. And again, not to compare myself to somebody else, but just hear me. All right. So my kids, I realized as a, as a young man growing up, kids, I didn't know what I was doing, so I got a hold of Dr. Dobson's stuff. I started educating myself on how to raise kids because I didn't want my kids dealing with some of the dysfunction that, you know, I had to deal with, okay? And um, fortunately enough, you know, my daughter's sitting over there right now with my grandson. Yeah, I dig it, praise God. Yeah. We don't like her, but we like that baby. All right, but anyway, all right. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So here, check this out. So when our kids were small, all right, Michelle and I, we, we, we got on the same page with this, and just hear me. So we, we understood that if we're going to discipline our kids, get this, we were going to discipline in the moment, at the time, and then move beyond it. Why? Because that's how God is. The Bible says that the mercies of God are new every day. So we were going to parent that way. So here it is. So let's say hypothetically our kids get in trouble. I grew up in a home where if you got in trouble, you didn't know when the punishment was going to end. And you didn't know when the parent was going to get over it. I grew up in a home where, where my, my stepdad and my mom, you didn't know when they were going to get over it. They got over it when they were ready to get over it. And what a way to live. You don't know where your parents coming from. You don't know if they're for you or against you. You don't know if they love you or not. No kid should go to bed worrying about whether their parent loves them or not. So here's what would happen at our house. Let's say, and I'm going to make this up, although this may have happened. <laughs> so let's say they got in trouble for using their cell phone, okay? Got in trouble for using their cell phone. And I'll use Michael since Whitney's here. <laughs> so got in trouble for using their cell phone. First of all, should there be consequences to them doing wrong? Are there consequences in God? Does God make us suffer our own consequences? Yeah, absolutely. Now watch this though. I'm going to take the cell phone. You're not going to have it for five days. Just making it up, all right? You're not going to have the cell phone for five days. That's the way it's going to be. All right? I love you. Hey, I love you. But listen, you made a decision. You made a choice. I didn't put you in this situation. You're going to take responsibility. You're not going to have your cell phone. And don't be mad at me because you chose this. It's the way it rolls, all right? It's all right. Still love you. It's all good. All right? This would happen at our house. So every night I would pray for the kids. So I get ready to go upstairs. And typically if it's one that we discipline, they're mad in their room, shut the door. Okay, yeah, go on with your bad self. Go upstairs, go, hey, it's time to go to bed. I'm going to pray for you. All right. I walk in there like, I go, hey, I'm going to pray for you. Man. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pray for you. Father, I ask you, bless him, bless him, touch him, lead him and guide him. If it was Michael, bless him, touch him, Lord, lead him, guide him, let him have great dreams, Lord. Thank you for my son. Thank you for him having a great night. All right? Good night. Love you. Yeah. All right? Walk out the door. All right? Hey, listen. Next morning rolls around. Here they come in the morning. Hey, everybody gets up, brush your teeth, comes downstairs, everybody's rolling. All right? Everybody's eating breakfast. Hey, Dad, what's up? Hey, what's up, man? What's going on? Hey, hey, I'm cool. Why? Because the mercies of God are new every day. Dad's mercies are new. I'm not mad. I'm not holding a grudge. I'm moving beyond it. Hear my heart, though. Hey, hey, Dad, 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 hey, 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 can I get my cell phone? No? No? No, I told you five, and I meant five, and guess how, how many days we're going? We're going five. I love you, though. <laughs> I love you. It's all good. You hear it? You hear it? My, my kids, they understood that I love them. I care about them. I, I'm not mad. I'm not holding a grudge. Why? Why? Why did we discipline that way? Why? Because that's the way God is. We still have to answer, in, and we still have to live with our consequences. 
but, but it's never that God puts us out because we did a dum-dum. Come on, you did a dum-dum too. We all do dumb stuff, but God still accepts us and loves us. And, and where did I get it? I got it because I have a proper understanding, and you and I all should have a proper understanding of God. We will treat others the way we see God. And so it's important that we paint the right image of God in our heart. Think about it like this. You ever thought about this? And I've, I've thought about it. Anybody see those mirrors? You ever see those mirrors that, that they change your image? You know, you ever walk through them? Now they're not popular. They used to be real popular. You know, you go to Chuck E. Cheese or any place like that, and they got those mirrors. And it's funny, if you ever hang around those mirrors, people love the skinny mirror. You know, where they walk in front, it's like, whoa, look at me. It's like, hey. And then they walk over into the other mirror. That's the blessed mirror. All right? And they look different. You know what I mean? And, and people don't hang out in front of that mirror. But, but the reality is, watch this. Neither one of those are you. Okay? It's a distorted image of you. It is my opinion that a lot of people see God through that distorted lens. And because they see God distorted, they feel like themselves are distorted. And because of that, they distort the way they treat other people. They don't see God as, watch this, they have a distorted image of God. God's not good. He put sickness on grandma and she died. Or grandma prayed and it didn't get answered. Or this or that. Or, you know, my friends were driving in a car and one of them got killed and God did that. Oh, you have a distorted image. You're looking in a mirror distorted. And because you have a distorted image, it's going to distort you. And it's going to distort the way you treat other people. I promise you it will. I promise you it will. Listen to what the Bible says in Genesis, and I love what it says. Listen to it. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image and make them a reflection of our... Have you ever noticed even people that don't believe in God, when they do what the Bible says, they feel blessed? People that go against the word of God, no matter what they do, they can't feel good about it. They can't feel good about it. They can't feel. This is why they try and hide it in a, a pill. They try and drink themselves to where they feel good about it. They try and get everybody in the community or everybody on Facebook or everybody on this or everybody on that to agree with them that what they're doing is okay. But the reality is in their heart, they know it's wrong. And because of that, they can't escape themselves. So they find everything they can on the outside to try and make them feel good about what's going on on the inside. And the reality is you can never make what's good on the inside right until you get it right with the Father. It's the way it works. When you get it right here and you get the right image of God and then you operate that way, you were designed and made that way to operate like God. Think about it like this. You were made to reflect the very nature of God. Look at this down here. God created human beings. He created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. This is why when we don't reflect God's nature, we don't feel right on the inside. When we do reflect God's nature, we feel right on the inside. We were hardwired to operate like God. And when we don't, we don't feel right. This is why giving and being gracious, this is why it, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Why does giving feel so good? It feels so good because you're acting like God. That's how God is. God's a giver. He wants to bless. Holding a grudge doesn't make you feel good. Why? Because that isn't how God is. Right? Right? It's the equivalent of this. Anybody know? I got a 26 Model T Roadster. All right? It's a Ford with a Chevy motor. It's fixed. Some of you will get it later. Car guys understand totally. But check this out. Do I put orange juice in that car? Just follow me. Do I put orange juice in that car? Why? All right, put that in your Tesla, first of all. all right? I just can't believe you insulted Tesla. Teslas don't make noises. You need an app for that. It's like driving a cell phone. All right? No, I can't believe you're dogging Tesla. I like things that go, well, anyway, all right. Hear my heart. Hear my heart on this. Why don't you put orange juice in a car? Just hear me. Talk to me. Wasn't designed. It wasn't designed to operate on orange juice. You're, watch this. The, the creator of the internal combustion engine made the motor to run on gas, fossil fuels. You put anything else in it, it's not going to work. 
because it has a design. You were designed by a creator, and he created you to work on certain things. And he created you, if you put orange juice in your spirit, it's not going to run. If you put, let me translate it, if you put unforgiveness in your heart, it's not going to work out. If you put bitterness in your heart, it's not going to work out. If you put greedy grady in your heart, it's not going to work out. Stingy ninja. I'm trying to rhyme it. <laughs> it's not going to work out. Anything you put in your heart that isn't the way God designed it, it's not going to go well. But watch this. Everything you do in your life, if you will operate the way God does, you will become all that God has created you to be because you are made in the image and likeness of God. Right? When you have the right view of who God is and you operate like him, I'm telling you, everything in your life will transform. Say, okay, Pastor Charlie, how do I begin to operate that way? I'm going to give you three little keys here, all right? Three keys, and then I'm going to land the plane, and then we're going to be, everybody's going to be happy and sing kumbaya. All right, here we go. Look at this part right here. It says, as his divine power has given us all things pertaining to life and, stop right there. Is that verse past, present, or future? Past, present, or future, listen to it. As his divine power has given, has given. <laughs> if I said you have went to jail, what's that mean? You know what I mean? Or, or you, you have won a million dollars. Is that past, present, or future? Past. All right, so here it is. As his divine power has given. Past, past. That took a long time to get there, y'all. <laughs> Look, past tense. Has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Stop right there. Has God given all things pertaining to life and godliness? Yes. According to that verse. You, don't, don't go there. Don't let your religious mind wander and go, yeah, but what about? No, stop. Let's just read the Bible. God has given us all things Pertaining to life and godliness. Stop there. Now watch the next part. Through the knowledge of. Okay. So you can't get there unless you have a knowledge of him though. God's given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. But you're not going to get it unless you have a knowledge of him. And I'm not talking about a false knowledge of him. I'm talking about a pure understanding of him. Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean. You and I have to understand God's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. And it's not the knowledge that God exists. It's the knowledge of his character and who he is. It's that God is a good God. You know Psalms 100.5 FM, I'm on there. <laughs> Psalms 100.5 says, for the Lord is good. He is good. Do you translate everything you know about God through the lens of he is good? He's good. How do I get there? I have all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. I have to have a knowledge of him. This is why it's important that you have the right understanding and right image of who God is in your heart. That God is good. He's gracious. He's a giving God. Look at this. It goes on. Who has called us from glory and vir by glory and virtue, by which we have been given exceeding great and precious, help me out, promises. Now watch this next part. That through these, these, the promises, you may be partakers of his divine nature. When you break it all down, here's what you're going to end up with. Look at this. A knowledge of him. Everybody say knowledge of him. It takes a knowledge of him, watch this, and belief in his promises. Knowledge of God, belief in his promises. I'm going to put those two in my heart. Then guess what automatically happens? I become a partaker of his divine nature. I actually begin to walk the way God designed me. I actually begin to operate like God in the earth. I, I didn't say I was God. I'm saying I begin to operate the way God designed me, right? I'm made in the image and likeness of God, but I'm not going to get there by accident. I'm going to take the promises of God. I'm going to take God's nature. I'm going to put those things in my heart, and then by operating that way, I'm going to become everything that God has called me to be, praise God. Amen? His divine nature working in my life through the promises and through the understanding of who God is. And this is why I say this. You ready? We, were ne we are never more like God 
than when we are generous and we give. And whether we give that, a, a thank you, whether we give a, give a I love you to somebody, whether we give whatever the case might be, we are never more like God than when we're generous. I mean, think about it like this. You check this out. This is what's interesting. People are draw, drawn to generosity. Do you believe that? Uh, yeah, everybody's partly cloudy on this. Check this out. Chick-fil-A does 80% the same as every other restaurant. Yet they're blowing everybody out of the water. Why? Because the 20% they understand is being generous. Hey, can you get me some barbecue sauce? What do they always say? My pleasure. That's part of their DNA. Where did they get that? They got that from God. When you run a business based upon God's nature, can I assure you it's going to prosper? Yeah. Yeah. It was designed, the earth was designed to respond to the goodness of God in the earth. I mean, think about it. Your life, when you operate the way God operates, some of you are like, well, Pastor Charlie, you don't understand. Those people over there, what if we, I'm going to give you an example of this, all right? Well, you're, you're taking all that stuff down to Kentucky. What if those people just, like, abuse it? Okay, first of all, know this. It's not my job to dictate their terms. It's my job to be God-like and be generous, fair? Second of all, I know this. Although things may leave my hands, they don't leave my life. And even though other people may abuse something that we give them or they give them or somebody else gives somebody, doesn't mean that the blessing doesn't apply to my life because I did what I was supposed to. Okay? That's the second thing. The third thing is, that's between them and God. I ain't even got to worry about that. I don't have to police the world to figure out how to be gracious. Because some of you are like, well, I'd be gracious if they would just. No, that's not what gracious does. Gracious doesn't care about what they repay. Gracious doesn't care about what they give back. Gracious says, I'm going to pour myself out. I'm going to give it all that I got. And whatever happens, it's in God's hands. Amen? Some of you are like, well, you know, my kids, I'd talk to them if they'd talk to me first. What are you doing? Be gracious and forgive them and move on. Love on your family. You will never, ever regret going, well, at least I did my part. No, I've never met anybody that said, I didn't, I, at least I did my part. I've met a whole lot of people that said, man, I wish I would have done more. You'll never beat yourself up for saying, hey, I did my part. I gave all I had. I blessed everyone I could, and I did everything I could to be a blessing in people's lives. Come on, amen? You'll never regret that. Why? Because you were made to be gracious in the eyes of God. God wants you to be gracious. God wants you to bless. God wants you to bless other people. Amen? Yes. Are you blessed? Yes. All right, let me pray for you, all right? Father, I thank you for each and every person. I pray that you bless them and touch them. And Lord, I pray that, that, that we will see your promises. We will see your character, God. We'll put those in our hearts and we'll become more like you each and every day. Father, we know that you are good. You are gracious. And we know we are made in your image and likeness. So, Father, help us be those people to go out and love people that even may not even like us. Help us be kind. Help us walk in your love. And help us have a great holiday season, Lord. And I thank you for blessing your people. In Jesus' name, everybody says amen. amen. Would you give the Lord a big clap? Praise God.